When one thinks of G.I. Joe, I'm willing to bet that the characters of Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow are two of the first names that come to mind for most die-hard and casual fans alike. For better or worse, they've become two of the biggest characters in the real American hero universe, and for good reason. I mean, who doesn't love a ninja, or a mysteriously masked and silent man in black? And their relationship and backstory is one of the most compelling and grounded in the franchise. But what many people often overlook is that there is actually a third character from G.I. Joe that shares a significant history with both Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow, and he is missed out more often than not, perhaps because he is so good at hanging around in the background, like a stalker. Lonzo R. Wilkinson codenamed Stalker, was part of the first wave of Joes released in 1982, lovingly referred to by many fans as the original 13. And going over the roster of these real American heroes, it was quite apparent that Stalker pretty much stood apart from all the rest. I mean, aside from the completely black-clad snake eyes and the obviously female Scarlet. While the rest of the team sported solid green uniforms and standard issue helmets, Stalker's distinctly camouflaged duds and beret definitely set him apart from his teammates. Oh yeah, and he was also African-American. But despite being the minority, or more specifically the only African-American on the team, Stalker was far from the token black guy. That was Snake Eyes. Sorry, couldn't help it. See, that was the beauty of this first offering of Joe's. Actually, the entire line moving forward. From the very beginning, it was never really about race. Stuff like that didn't really matter to a six-year-old like me. What I cared about was that he looked cool. Anyway, with all that aside, Stalker's official designation was a ranger. The Green Ranger to be exact. Just kidding. Sorry, I'll stop, I'll stop. So, Stalker was a ranger which is defined in the military sense as a soldier specifically trained to act in small groups that make rapid surprise raids on enemy territory, as well as involved in special ops missions of recovering stolen picnic baskets from thieving bears. And just to address the elephant in the room, he did not get his codename Stalker because he liked to pursue others obsessively and aggressively to the point of harassment. Stalker was given his codename due to his exceptional skills as a recon specialist. Again, in the military sense, a stalker is one who can move stealthily and observe the enemy without being detected and gather intelligence. So yeah, with that settled, let's move on, shall we? Very early on in the original Marvel comics, well before Duke came into the picture, Stalker was the field leader of the G.I. Joe team and for good reason as he was the first to be recruited into the team by the then Colonel Hawk and together would go on to recruit the rest of the original 13, the first of which would be Stalker's old friend, Snake Eyes. But we're getting way ahead of ourselves as a huge part of Stalker's story starts well before G.I. Joe, well before meeting Hawk and well before he even met Snake Eyes. I promise we'll get to all that in due time. But first, let's start at the beginning in Detroit, Michigan, where a young Lonzo grew up in the meanest sections of the city. It was here where he first learned to fight and fend for himself. In fact, it was in this situation of excessive violence that Lonzo thrived as he eventually became the warlord of a large street gang. Unfortunately though, that same world of violence would take the lives of his two older brothers. Seeing how their death tore his mother apart served as a wake-up call for Lonzo, and they sought to remove himself from the vicious cycle of gang life, and he saw joining the military as the best way to do this. Talk about jumping out of the frying pan and into the fire. Anyway, after training, Stalker was eventually deployed to Vietnam. And as a side note, to spare his mom from the knowledge that her son was going to a full-blown war zone, he told her that he was stationed in Germany instead, where he had his mail rerouted to him through a cousin living there. So while his mom thought he was out touring Germany and sampling the local beers, Stalker was actually out on another tour deep in the jungles of Vietnam as part of a special six-man long-range recon patrol behind enemy lines. Along with Stalker was the quiet and even then mysterious Snake Eyes and Tommy Storm Shadow Arashikage. And rounding up the team would be fellow soldiers Wade Collins, Ramon Escobedo, and Dick Saperstein. And if none of those guys' names ring a bell, well I guess you know that there's a pretty good reason why. Six months into their tour, the group stumbles upon an encampment of North Vietnamese soldiers which leads to an immediate firefight. And while initially taken by surprise, the Vietnamese soldiers quickly gain the upper hand. First to be taken down are Collins and Escobedo, the latter basically getting most of his face blown off. 
Saperstein attempts to outflank the enemy but unfortunately steps on a landmine, instantly ending him, leaving Stalker, Storm Shadow, and Snake Eyes barely managing to reach their extraction chopper. After the war, the three survivors continued on with their lives with Storm Shadow returning to Japan. He was joined by Snake Eyes who found out that his own family had been tragically killed in a car wreck on their way to pick him up. And as for Stalker, he remained in the military and was assigned to a peacekeeping mission in Barovia under the command of a then Lieutenant Colonel Clayton Hawk Abernathy. It was during this mission that Stalker's men discovered explosives in a refugee camp that would have killed a number of children if they had gone off. Stalker knew their options and time were limited and so he resorted to physically beating a captured terrorist to force him to reveal the locations of the explosives, which he did. And while the information that Stalker obtained saved a good number of innocent lives, the means of how he acquired it gained the ire of the Major General who Hawk reported to. But despite everything, Hawk refused to give up Stalker, as while he deemed Stalker's actions wrong, he himself acknowledged that given the same choice, he would have done the same thing. Hawk blamed the higher-ups in the chain of command as those ultimately responsible, and he wanted to see who of them would be willing to accept it. In the end, the buck stopped with Hawk who was given a court-martial over the incident. But more importantly though, Hawk's principled stand greatly impressed another general, General Lawrence J. Flagg, who had the charges on Hawk dropped and recruited him to form the G.I. Joe team with Stalker as his first recruit, which basically brings us up to speed with Stalker's story. Sorta. See, another interesting twist to Stalker, Snake Eyes, and Storm Shadow's shared past in Vietnam was that apparently they weren't the only survivors on their ill-fated squad. Wade Collins, against all odds, survived the conflict as well and was taken in as a prisoner of war for two years. Eventually, though, he returned to America at the end of the war and due to unfortunate circumstances, ended up getting recruited into Cobra as a Crimson Guard. Now, for those not in the know, the Crimson Guard were the elite of the elite in the Cobra ranks. They were so highly regarded that they were not wasted on the battlefield and instead operated as sleeper agents infiltrating communities and governments as highly trained professionals. Lawyers, accountants, doctors. Yeah, I know that doesn't sound very cool, but I guess the point was that they were everywhere without you knowing it. Anyway, their cover was so deep that the Crimson Guard would undergo facial reconstructive surgery to make them all look alike. And they were all named Fred. That way, for whatever reason, a Crimson Guard agent could be replaced on the fly with another one without skipping a beat should the previous one, you know, die. And so Wade Collins, now named Fred, took residence in Staten Island to take his place as the head of the Broca family. Broca, Broca, what an interesting name. If I didn't know any better, that would look like a pretty good anagram for Cobra. Man, that's high level infiltration protocol right there. And so the story goes, Wade call, I mean, Fred Broca eventually tracks down and confronts his former friends, Stalker and Snake Eyes, and reveals his true identity to them as their long thought dead comrade, Wade Collins. Anyway, Stalker, because you know, Snake Eyes can't talk, manages to convince Wade that he was being used by Cobra, and so he decides to leave the organization and start a new life, thankfully with his adopted family in tow, who choose to go with him. And just as another aside, Wade Collins' adopted son, Sean, eventually grows up to join G.I. Joe himself as the ninja apprentice of Snake Eyes, codenamed Kamakura. Well, did we go off on a tangent or what? Sorry about that. I just love how writer Larry Hama weaved the histories of many of his main Joe characters in a relatively organic and believable way. I mean, at least he didn't go overboard and turn Duke and the Baroness into former lovers, with her brother and Duke's best friend eventually turning into Cobra Commander. I mean, who in their right mind would ever do something like... Oh, okay, never mind. Anyway, before we get back on course, I figure that this is as good a time as any to ask for your help by leaving a like or comment for this video, or if you still haven't yet, sub to my channel. Or if you would like to go the extra mile, why not try out being a friend of the toy shelf for even more exclusive goodies. All you gotta do is just click the join button on my channel's homepage. So don't be a stalker, say hello and stick around. But either way, thank you for your support, it is very much appreciated. So back to stalking. 
I, I mean, Stalker. Like I said, Stalker was one of the first Joes to stand out way back in 82 with his camouflage deco, snazzy beret, and M32 pulverizer submachine gun. He also featured quite prominently in the first cartoon miniseries, but after that, he kind of faded quietly into the background as newer Joes were added to the team year after year, including a new ranger in 1986, Beachhead. But despite seemingly being replaced, it wasn't long until Stalker was back with a new figure in 1989, this time as a Tundra Ranger. This new version still sported his signature camo pattern, just with some added winter gear and a more snug beanie in place of his signature beret, ready to do battle in the snow. I guess this was done to differentiate him more from Beachhead, who despite having a penchant of not using deodorant, had himself become very popular with the fans as well. This new Stalker came fully equipped with a machine gun mounted kayak. Talk about a major upgrade. And it was surprisingly featured in the 1989 miniseries Operation Dragonfire. But to be honest, the less said about that series, the better. Over the next few years, we would get a couple more unique versions of Stalker before the real American hero line would eventually come to an end in the mid 90s. First up would be the Talking Battle Commander Stalker in 1992. And as the name suggests, this Stalker came with a ginormous backpack. Is that a shuriken? Must be from his buddy Snake Eyes, sorry. Ginormous backpack that was in reality a little electronic device that played a bunch of pre-recorded lines. So this Stalker could charge into battle spouting out phrases like Somehow that last one kind of feels off for Stalker, but whatever, Hasbro didn't think so. As with the next Stalker in 1994, Battle Core Stalker, Let's Party is specifically stated in his file card as his main catchphrase. So yeah, party on dudes. Oh, and while this isn't Stalker per se, I thought it would be worth mentioning that for their own international version of G.I. Joe, Argentinian company Plasterama also released the original Stalker toy as a new character the paratrooper Manle, or is it Manly, whatever, giving him a predominantly blue color scheme based on the Argentinian flag and adding more facial hair and a lighter complexion. Anyway, since then, Stalker has remained a constant presence in almost all modern iterations of the toy line. The 25th anniversary gave us Stalker in his traditional camo, a darker camo, and a lighter tune inspired camo. And although he didn't play a major role in the excellent micro-series G.I. Joe Resolute in 2009, Stalker was there, infiltrating a Cobra Health facility with fellow Ranger Beachhead and rescued hostages, which was enough to give him another figure, this time with some cool dreads. The final 1-18th scale Stalker was released as part of the 30th anniversary in 2011. This Stalker was a nice mix of the original vintage figure with some really cool modern updates, dreads. And speaking of modern updates, we've got two more Stalkers to cover in the larger 1 12th scale. First up is the G.I. Joe Classified version released in 2022. Again, this is more of a realistic real-world take on Stalker, which for the most part, I'm pretty happy with. I'm just, I, I don't know, not a big fan of the face sculpt. It just feels too old and grizzled. Yes, I get it. Stalker is old. I mean, he was part of the original 13, but yeah, it doesn't quite do it for me. I wonder if there's any other possible head swaps for this guy. If you got any suggestions, let me know in the comments down below. But anyway, for those who prefer a stalker even closer to the original look, Hasbro's got your back as well with a retro-styled repaint of this guy out this year. But for me, I'm quite happy with what I have, especially when it comes to the last stalker in my collection. While I admit Stalker really wasn't much of a factor after the first G.I. Joe miniseries, he was a big enough deal to merit a much coveted spot in the very limited Super 7's Ultimate G.I. Joe line which was completely based on the cartoon. And while it took some time, I finally got my animated Stalker this year and he's great. As per usual with the Ultimates line, aside from looking like he stepped right out of the TV screen, he comes with a good number of accessories from the cartoon. My favorites being the jetpack that he was often depicted using, as well as a dynamite bomb that he famously throws into the air and blasts out of the sky in the original cartoon introduction. And finally, I don't know if this would be considered much of a stretch, but when news of the first live-action G.I. Joe movie broke out in early 2000, I was almost pretty sure that Stalker had a very good chance of making the cut for the good guys. And when actor Marlon Wayans was announced as part of the cast, I thought, hmm, not my first choice, but I guess he could pull off Stalker. But then it was announced that he would be playing Ripcord. 
Huh? Well, even if it's not confirmed, my take is that given Wayne's ripcord played the role of the best friend to Channing Tatum's Duke, the character was meant to be Stalker in essence, but I figured that they just couldn't use the name Stalker for obvious negative reasons. Oh well, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. But if you want to know more about how Marlon Wayans' ripcord turned out, feel free to check out his story here. Or if you want other Joe's stories, check out this playlist over here. Either way, thanks for watching and I hope you come back for more. <laughs>